Welcome back to another video in the Skill Cookbook Recipes series, where you follow along as I overcome different challenges in the learning process. In this series, I'm looking at Forever Maze, a game in Swift I built that acts in real time over the, the internet to actually synchronize the positions of all players and objects in the game. So this game is played with your friends and each friend is actually um, represented as a data object on Firebase. Firebase is a real-time data engine, and in this uh, article or this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how I built a base class on top of Firebase that acts or feels almost as though it's just a normal instance of some local object, but the properties on that instance are immediately synchronized. So, just as a starting point, let's kind of talk a little bit about Firebase. When you register for Firebase, you have some base URL. Uh, so, that might be like game.firebase.io. And every object follows a sort of tree structure. So, if we, for example, have players, we might have the path players. And then if we have a player ID uh, for you know, each unique player in the game, that would be represented here at this part of the path. But the path metaphor continues to extend where, or tree metaphor, I should say, any object contained in that ID field is to going to itself be representable by a path. So what we end up doing when we want to create an object that represents this player is to have a base class in Swift that I call a dynamic object. So our player class is going to inherit from this base dynamic object class. The dynamic object class is going to be instantiated with this path here the players slash ID path in order to load up. And it's going to do three main tasks. First thing is load the initial state. Second thing is going to be to track remote changes. And that's just when something changes elsewhere on somebody else's version of the game, like they did something to a player that causes the player's values to change, like their health to decrease, for example. So when a remote change comes in, of course, we need the class here to reflect it in real time. And the third is, of course, broadcast or write the changes when the local client wants to make a modification. So let's just kind of take these um, one at a time. But first, we're going to have to take a step back, and we have to talk about some two key topics here. Uh, one is KVO, and one is reflection. Reflection is what lets us figure out what properties we're going to want to monitor. So in the case of the player class, if we define a normal Swift class, we've got these variables on it, right? So you might have var health, and it's going to be an int equals zero. And that's in a class scope, so it's a property on that class. What we want to be able to do is to magically infer that we want to track this health variable. Don't have to go and manually set it up in Firebase or anything like that. I, I want the very fact that I've defined a variable called health on the player class to be sufficient to automatically record that data online. No other setup record required. So in order to do that, we're going to use this idea of reflection. Reflection allows a piece of code to figure out about itself, kind of like looking in a mirror. So what this means is that we can actually reflect upon the class and from that infer what variables exist. 
for example, the player, the code in the player class could figure out that it has a variable called health by using reflection. What's more, it can find out other attributes about that variable, like if it's readable or writable. Now, as an aside, when I first built this class, I really wanted to use the keyword dynamic. in order to indicate that something was a online synchronized variable. Now, I did run into some problems with that. I'm not sure if, uh, if this is a bug in Swift or if this is something that I'm missing, but the uh, property or that should come out from the reflection seems inconsistent when it comes specifically to the dynamic variable. However, that aside, you can still approximate reflection uh, or approximate this sort of detection quite easily by looking at other things like writability and so on and so forth. So in the source code that I've posted in the accompanying article here, and by the way, if you haven't seen it already, you should definitely go check out the blog post which accompanies this video because all of the source code is there for you to download and look at. You can find it in the show notes or the uh, description of the YouTube video. So when I wrote this class, I wrote it in such a way that it has its own uh, variable on the class called Firebase Properties. And this variable is um, computed at execution time by using reflection in order to return all of the different property names that we want to watch or to um, consider to be online variables. So the Firebase Properties um, attribute of the class represents what we want to watch. Once we have that, we can use this array of property names and this notion of KVO or key value observing in order to find out when a value changes locally. So we're moving down to actually step three here. Apologize if that's a bit out of order, but when something gets written like player dot health equals zero, when that is executed, we want to know that that change happened. So in order to broadcast that change, we simply use key value observing to see when that value changes. And if the attribute name that has changed health here, matches with one of our registered Firebase attributes here, then we can write it to the server and do that automatically um, right there in the code. So looping back now to part one, when we want to load the initial state, it's pretty much just iterating over the Firebase properties array and checking a, um, a Firebase snapshot that we've downloaded to see if those values exist and just copying them into local. And finally, the uh, step two here, tracking the remote changes, is a matter of continuing to leave that uh, Firebase observer in place, which initially downloaded the data, and continuing to listen to it for any additional changes and again, if any change that comes in that matches one of the registered Firebase properties, then we know that some remote change has occurred and we can copy that into the local and do any sort of thing we need to do. All of this is really important for Forever Maze because I really didn't want to be writing a bunch of boilerplate code over and over again when it came to making different objects that were um, online, because the whole game's online players and objects in the world and the state of different tiles, everything is online synchronized. So I didn't want to have to set each of these different attributes up uh, one by one. So this, this setup really worked well for me, though there's definitely some room for some improvement. Uh, I would love to see this kind of polished up even more. If you have any thoughts or feedback or have an idea on how it could be done better, please be sure to let me know in the comments here in the YouTube video or in the blog post comment section as well. 
Thanks for watching this, and make sure to check out the other articles in the series. This is just one in many about uh, the different lessons I learned and approaches I took to coding the game Forever Maze.